Please stand. Let's read Psalm 99 together. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awe-inspiring name. He is holy. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this together. Wandering into the night Wanting a place to hide This weary soul This bag of bones I try with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond and just when I, and just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, you picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you healed my heart. You changed my name forever free I'm not the same I thank the master I thank the savior Sing I thank God I cannot deny what I've seen Got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind to my old friends burden and bitterness you can't just keep them moving now you ain't welcome you and every voice from now from now till I walk streets of gold I sing of how you save my soul this wayward son has found his way back I thank the Savior, sing I thank God Amen, let's sing this together, sing hell lost another one Hell lost another one I am free, I am free, I am free Hell lost another one I am free, I am free Sing, hell lost another one. I am free. Yes, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Oh, you pick me up. You turn me around. You place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master. I thank the savior because you healed my Sing, I thank God. Give him praise, church. And old things have passed away. Your love has 
stay the same Your constant grace remains the cornerstone The things that we thought were dead Are breathing in life again Cause your sun to shine on darkest nights For all that you've done we will pour out our love This will be our anthem song Jesus we love you Oh how we love you the hopeless the hopeless have found their hope the orphans now have a home and all that was lost has found its place in you and you lift our
our hearts adore our hearts adore we adore you Jesus our hearts adore Amen as we sing our last song, I just want to read a verse of scripture from Romans 15, verse 13. And it says, Now may the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to take this time to just maybe take a pause or maybe slow things down for a second. Because I think we all can agree that we live in a world where it's just very fast paced and we never have the time to just sit and really just think about everything we're going through. And I think we can all agree that sometimes it's hard to say, God, I trust you. Maybe because of the circumstances that we're facing in life, maybe our mental things, maybe physical things. But it's easy to forget who our God is. It's easy to lose sight of the God of hope, the God of love, the God of peace. And that's okay. I think God wants us to be vulnerable and real to him. And maybe some of us in the room aren't okay. Maybe some of us in the room are going through things and it's okay to not feel 100% all the time but we have a God of hope and a God who is living inside of us every day. And I just kind of want us to just feel that in this moment. That when we're feeling confused, God, when we don't know what to do, God, let us just accept where we are, but God, let us learn to trust you, to relearn what it means to be a child, to learn what it means to be loved by you. God, let us not be afraid to go to you. God, it's your breath in our lungs. You're the reason that we sing. Jesus, we have hope in you. So let's just take a few moments just to really sit and just speak to God, whatever it is that you want to say, whatever it is that you want to speak on. We lift this song up to you. Let's sing this together. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Sing grace. sing that again you give life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs God we pour out our praise to you only and great are you life you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore you restore every heart that is broken sing great and great
that you just continue, Lord, just to speak into our hearts. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we just had these intentional conversations with you during this worship or during this time together. Lord, let it be known and reminded to us, Lord, that you see us, you know us, and you love us, God. And God, that you're there with us every step of the way. We thank you, Lord Jesus, just for this time, Lord, just to be in your presence as one body, as one family. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, just to worship you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's thank our worship team. I'm glad uh, Chelsea kind of tipped um, the cards a little bit to let you know that we're back to on the subject of wrath. And um, just, just a reminder to you, um, you know, it's probably been a couple of years that I've been contemplating doing this series at um, the end of Romans chapter 1. And, uh, and the more and more we got closer and closer, the more I felt compelled, like this was, this was really a, a, 
a subject for us to talk about now because if you want to try to understand what's going on in the crazy world that we're living in, the end of Romans chapter 1 tells you everything you need to know. And so progressively, we're going bit by bit through this. As If you've been with us, you know that we're not, you know, we're kind of going at a snail's pace, but it's because I want us to go deeper. I want us to understand more substance of what it's all about. I really want us to have a very clear understanding of the person of God, how it is that he works with people, um, because as we understand that, um, not only will it deepen our worship, but it'll deepen our love for him, and it will enable us to be even better, um, you know, people who have a witness in the world because we see what God's doing and we, we can tell people what God's doing. So that, that's really the impetus of this whole series, and so we took a break there for Easter last week, but we're going to dive in the next few weeks and... And uh, here, here's the good news is, I guess, <laughs> is that we will be done with this series before we move. So that's, that's good. We'll, we'll, try, we'll be doing something else probably the week, be- our very last week here. Anyway, Lord, I pray that you'd be the one who really opens up our eyes and our hearts. This, this word of God is your word. Your spirit is the one who takes that word and makes it alive and changes us as a result of it. It's the spirit that gives us understanding. It's the spirit who helps us to see you clearly as you reveal yourself so that we can worship you in fullness. We can worship you, as the scriptures say, in spirit and in truth. That we don't have to walk around with misconceptions or misunderstandings or question marks about really some of the most significant things that could ever be spoken of. And so we trust that tonight you're going to do that same work that you've been doing as we've looked into this subject, and we pray that you would be glorified as a result of us meeting together. Thanks that you'll work towards that end, and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In, in 1906, a man named Percival Lowell, he was a, a a wealthy man from Boston who founded the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. But in 1906, he started a project, and the goal of that project was to search to find what he was convinced was the ninth planet in our solar system. Nobody had known anything about this before then. He termed it Planet X. And about three years later, Lowell and a colleague that had been working with him, uh, having used physics and mathematics, they they came, came up with several suggested celestial coordinates um, where they thought that ninth planet might be way out there somewhere. And so essentially what they did was they they provided some some basic you know, locations where, where those uh, in the observatories around the world uh, could just point their telescopes in that direction because we think that's where it is in the hopes of, of finding this planet that he was sure that was there. Unfortunately, Lowell died before anything was ever found and it really took about 20 years before the project was surfaced again people started working on it. The observatory's director handed it over to a a 23-year-old young man named Clyde Tombaugh. Tombaugh had an idea. His idea was to systematically take photos of the universe, certainly within that realm where where Lowell had been thinking about, with the idea that, that hopefully he could locate anything that might be shifting between the pictures that he was taking. And so on February 18, 1930, he took two pictures, spaced with a little bit of time apart, but of exactly the same place, and discovered that there was a dot of light that had moved in those two pictures from one location to the other location. He had confirmed what Lowell had thought all along, and that was that there was a ninth planet and he named it Pluto. Interestingly, interesting name, Pluto. It's it's the the name of the Roman god of the underworld. So that's a little interesting. But but you might remember there's bad news in the story of Pluto. Sadly, 
Poor Pluto has gone through some very difficult times. In, in 2006, Pluto was demoted from planet status. They had decided there was a different definition that should be true of what are planets and what are not planets, and so Pluto lost his you know, vaulted position of being the ninth planet in our solar system. But as you can imagine, there, there are people who were, were not going to take that lying down. And so uh, a group of people started a campaign. Uh, it was to make Pluto great again. <laughs> they have failed to date to uh, make any difference there, but poor Pluto's still out there. Uh, but, but I was thinking about that because I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question, simple question. Everybody in the room could answer this question. But it points us in the direction that we're going to go tonight as we kind of dig into the Word of God. I say this, we mark the discovery of Pluto to have been in the year 1930. But here's the question, but was that when Pluto actually came into existence? Good answer. Absolutely, certainly not, right? Pluto was always there. Whether we call it a planet or whatever we want to call it, it was always there. But what had to happen, here's what had to happen, is that, that we, the, the planet had to be revealed to us. It always existed, it was always there, but we had to see now with different eyes. It had to be revealed to us that it actually was there all along. Whether we knew it or not, it was always there. And then when suddenly we had the information, we could identify it, then, then everything all of a sudden changed and we said, oh, we discovered Pluto. No, you really didn't discover Pluto. It, you know, you, it was revealed and you get the idea. Sometimes, I think if you think about our lives, there are a lot of things like this out there. There are a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things that are mysterious. There's a lot of things that are probably held secret. And, and what has to happen is that, that circumstances have to come about in order that, that those things can be revealed to us, that we can suddenly see things that we hadn't seen before. You know, we come to know things that we, we really didn't know about before. It's, it's part of the nature, I think, of us living, you know, here in this planet and this time frame. It, it's, it's true that certain things have to be brought to our attention. They have to be placed on our radar screen, if you will, so that we can focus on them. And, and that's what I, I want to look at tonight. We're going to go back to the passage that we've been looking at. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1.18. He said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Notice the, it's something that's revealed. Revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And in specific, what I want to look at tonight is really a, a couple of questions and try to, using this verse, come up with some answers to this, these two questions. The first is, when is God's wrath revealed? And the second is, over what is God's wrath revealed? And so we want to start with that first one. When is God's wrath revealed? Now, there's a reason that we need to answer that question. And that's because my guess is uh, that probably, maybe nearly all of us in this room, certainly at some point in our Christian lives, um, lived with a misunderstanding of the answer to this question. A misunderstanding as to when will God's wrath be revealed. Uh, we, we have lived with kind of an incorrect timeline. We, we don't really know the answer to that question, so I think we need to clarify that question because it makes an enormous difference in the way we look at the world around us today. Now, you've probably heard sermons before. When we think of the wrath of God, most people, I was certainly one of those people, who who's thought to themselves, well, I've heard all these sermons and, and my, my understanding is that the wrath of God is going to be revealed at some point way off in the future. It's going to be revealed at, at some point when, when, there's the, you know, when God institutes judgment against mankind. And so it's not something here, it's not something now, it's not something that's been around for the, in the past, but it, it's only something that's way out there in the future. 
And, and the reason that we get that is because really when people start talking about the wrath of God, very often they just move immediately to this whole idea of the judgments that God brings about. And if you are a student of the scriptures and you've heard a few sermons anyway, you know that there are two judgments that are, that are coming. One, one is called the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat of Christ, if you want to get Greek on it. And uh, the other is called the great white throne judgment. Two different judgments. They are in the future. And both of those judgments, you know, have uh, a, a, an opportunity. It's really an expression of the wrath of God being poured out, at least in one of those. Fast version, we could do a whole series just on the judgments of God. But, but if, if you want just the, the Cliff's Note version of this, the first judgment is the judgment seat of Christ. That really is a judgment of believers, and, and what it's really a judgment for is about the nature of the works that we have done as we've lived out our lives. And what happens is those works will be exposed because they've all been written in the books that God has. Those works that we've done will be analyzed. They'll be evaluated by the Lord. And, and in this case, what God is going to do, according to 1 Corinthians, is that, that at that point then, when this judgment happens, it's not a judgment of wrath being poured out. Rather, what the scripture teaches us is that this will be a judgment for rewards. So believers who have no sin because of what Jesus has done, they come, our works are evaluated. Some works are good. They, they make it through the evaluation. Some of them are just pushed aside. Um, but th those that are, are seen to be of value, God wants to make sure that we're rewarded for those things. So that's really not the wrath of God. It's just a judgment of God for reward. The second one, though, is a different story. This is the great white throne judgment. This is largely a, a judgment of unbelievers. Th this, this judgment is a judgment where the eternal destiny of people will be determined. And so what happens is people appear before the, th the great white throne, the, the book of life is opened up, and those whose name is not listed in the book of life, whose deeds have been evil, will experience the outpouring of the wrath of God upon them. They, they will experience eternal damnation. Uh, they'll experience what, Lord willing, none of us will experience. You've got to know Christ for this to be this way. Uh, but but we, don't, we don't want to, you know, we want to make sure that we're on the right side, so make sure you've got Jesus here. But what, what God's going to do is he's, he's going to allow them to experience exactly what they wanted. In their life, they didn't want anything to do with God, and at the end, what he does is he gives them a place where they will not have anything to do with God. They will not experience the presence, the, all the blessings uh, of God. And that's horrific. That's horrible. That's terrifying. That's what happens at the great white throne judgment. Unbelievers will finally have that time of judgment. Well, what happens to us, I think, is that it's because we've, we've kind of focused on these two things, thinking about the wrath of God. And you notice the first one's really not about the wrath of God. The second one is definitely about the wrath of God. But both of those things are somewhere in the future. So in our minds, we've gotten muddled in terms of how the wrath of God fits in with our lives. And we think, well, the wrath of God is only something that's going to happen much later. And so we tend to think that the wrath of God is going to be stored up in the life of each person waiting to be revealed in those days of judgment that are in the future. Then I say this, but wait. As you're sitting here tonight and you know your Bibles, you've read your Bible, can you think of any times in the scriptures where the, God, where the wrath of God was actually revealed against people. When the wrath of God was poured out on people in the Bible, those of you shaking your head, right answer. Absolutely. There are lots of indications of that. There are lots of times that God has poured out his wrath. I mean, think just for instance, what about the great flood in the days of Noah? Why was there such a great flood? Because of the sinfulness of people and the wrath of God came like a, you know, this, this tumultuous wave and the great flood occurred. How about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? 
That was certainly a time when, 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 the, when the wrath of God was poured out upon a, a couple of cities. How about the collapse of the Tower of Babel? Here all of the humans were. They were all building this tower to, to, to God, to be like God. And God said, no, you're not. And the wrath of God was poured out and the tower was disintegrated. How about this one? How about the cross of Jesus Christ? That was an expression of the wrath of God. It's when the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus for our sins. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I didn't do any calculations. I read somebody who said that, you know, if you were to look in the scriptures, what you'd find is that there's, there's about 31,173 judgments that are recorded in the Bible. I don't know if that's true. I mean, there's lots of them. I mean, we could talk about Pharaoh's army. Remember Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea? It was a moment when the, when the wrath of God was poured out upon Pharaoh and all of their troops and literally destroyed them all. We could talk about the 3,000 people of God who died after the golden calf fiasco, the rebellion at, at Mount Sinai. You could talk about Korah, an individual who kind of got a bunch of people worked up. Scriptures tell us about 250 people who rebelled against Moses in the desert. They basically were sick and tired of Moses and his leadership. They weren't getting what they thought they were going to get or wanted to get. They were hoping on a promised land, not a wilderness. And so they basically just rebelled. They, they refused to go any further. They mutinied against Moses. And you know what happened? God's wrath was poured out on those people in a very graphic way. The scripture tells us that the earth just literally opened up swallowed them in, closed up and buried them alive if they survived the fall. Those were indications. Those were times when the wrath of God showed up. Not sometime in the distant future. Those, those from our time frame occurred in the past. For the people that were living then, those, those expressions of the wrath of God occurred in their present time. Just as they lived there. So I think we need to begin to understand and be very careful in the way we think about the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not just something that's going to be revealed and poured out at some distant point in the future at the great white throne judgment of God. It will be done then too. But if you start looking at the scriptures and thinking through this, I'm sure you'd agree with me that really what you see is that, that the, the wrath of God has been poured out upon people in the past. For them, it was the present. The, the wrath of God is being poured out presently in the lives of people. And yes, the wrath of God will be poured out in the future at some point in time. And, and I think that we would not have this skewed focus or this, uh, this misunderstanding about, about, the, about the timing of the wrath of God if we, if we just looked at what Paul said and, and very carefully looked at what he said because look what it says. It says, for the wrath of God, what? Is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The wrath of God is revealed. You know every once in a while I have to Greek out on you. Here's one of those places. When it says is, the, the verb that used there is, here's the for all of you, you know, language connoisseurs. Uh, the word is here is a, is a present passive verb. Now, what that means is this. If it's a present tense verb, it means it's in continuous action. It's, it's presently something that is continuously op in operation. Passive means that it's, that it's uh, an action that is done by an outside agent. In other words, we don't bring, you know, the wrath of God we're not the agents of the wrath, but, but an outside agent. It's God himself who is the agent of bringing his wrath, and what it tells us is he's doing that presently. And so when we begin thinking about what does all this mean, what, what, it, what it means to us really is that, that, that just as now the wrath of God is presently being poured out on people, 
That was true in the past. We saw that. We saw that it's going to be in the future too. It's present. It's continuous. So at every point in time, all throughout history, the the wrath of God, the expression of the wrath of God has been poured out. So even now as we sit here, even now as we live here, the wrath of God is being poured out all around us. So from the beginning of time, all the way to the end of time, and every time in between, the wrath of God has been revealed, is being revealed, and will be revealed in our midst. Now we may not have thought about that before. (laughs) I I mean, we, we, we didn't identify that before. It was like Pluto to us. Somebody had to help us see it. That's what I'm driving at, is is I want us to be able to understand and see that that in reality, we here, we each probably, all of us, have experienced at one point or another in our lives uh, the wrath of God being poured out. What's, What's the wrath? You remember? Make sure you remember this definition. The wrath of God is his hatred of sin. That's what the wrath is. Remember we said, it's not like rage, like we've talked, well, like we've thought about. That was another one of our misunderstandings. God is always operating out of love. But his, so his anger is not anything like our anger. His anger operates in, within the bounds of perfect love and perfect holiness and, and all that he is. But he hates sin. And so we need to understand that the reality is the wrath of God has, has been revealed you know, in, in our lives. You may not have identified it, but I can guarantee you, you've seen it operational in the lives of your neighbors, the people around you, on your street, in your neighborhood, in your community, you know, in, in your county, in your state, in your nation, in the globe. The wrath of God is presently being unleashed. Let me give you a list of some ways that we see it and we just have never identified it this way. As many write, you can can understand the wrath of God in our conscience. You realize, don't you, that every single person has a sense of right and wrong. Every single person feels that, that sin and evil should be judged. That's an expression of the idea of the wrath of God who hates sin and wants to eliminate sin. All of us have sinned at some point in time and we've felt shame, we've, we've felt guilt, we've felt remorse for our sin. That's all part of the revelation in our own experience of the wrath of God, his hatred for sin. We find it in the consequences of our sin. I mean, God has ordained consequences for sin. That's an expression of his hatred for sin. He too wants, has consequences so that we will understand that is not a great way to live. Right? I mean, I mean it's very practical, the things that God has done. I mean, I mean you, you can't be a glutton and avoid the health risks of overeating, right? Right? You can't be sexually promiscuous and, and avoid all the problems that come with that, from disease to illness to incredible, devastating relational difficulties. All of those. You need to understand that, that, that there are consequences to our sin, and the fact that there are consequences reminds us that God hates sin. And the fact that those consequences are there is really an expression of his wrath being revealed. How about in, in the whole state of creation and nature? You realize, don't you, that every time you pull a weed out of the ground, the weed is there because of the consequences of sin. It's, it's, it's you know, the fact that, that the ground doesn't produce like it could or should. All, all, the, all the things that have been broken because of that original sin are really results of the fact that, that God's wrath has been poured out upon the earth. The earth groans underneath the wrath of God. I mean, every natural disaster. I mean, this week it was New York. 
You know, every, every natural disaster really is a, a groaning. It's an it's a, it's a understanding that the wrath of God, his hatred of sin, is being re- revealed. You can see it in the universality of death. The scriptures are real clear. The wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. If we're sinners... We deserve to die, and we deserve the eternal consequences except for what Jesus has done for us. So every time we witness a death, it's really an expression of the wrath of God being revealed all around us. You could look at it in the biblical history of God's people. How many times did the nation of Israel suffer as a result of their sin. How many conversations have I had in you know, my 30 plus years in ministry with people who said, man, those people, they were really whacked out, you know? They were messed up. And then we remind ourselves, oh yeah, that's us. We'd have done this exact same thing. But how many times did that happen? Over and over, why did it happen? Because God hates sin and his wrath is revealed the presence of that sin. How about in the individual lives of biblical characters? If I mention to you King Saul, do you get a story in your mind? If, if, I, if I give you the name Nebuchadnezzar, do you see him in the field eating grass? If I give you the name of Judas, do you see him hanging from a tree? It's all the wrath of God being revealed against sin. How about in the history of all great civilizations? You know that there's not a single great civilization that has ever stood in this world that has stood the test of time. Eventually their sin, their internal sin will will bubble up and the consequences will be so pervasive that 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 entire empire, that amazing civilization just crumbles. Every one of them has gone through that. I remind you that we shouldn't think that we won't. The wrath of God is being expressed all the time throughout all of history. And then again, I remind you, the cross of Christ. The death of Christ is a perfect example of what happens when the wrath of God is poured out. Remember what God did. Not only did Jesus die physically, But you remember that he was separated from the Father. He says, God, why have you forsaken me? The ultimate issue of death is not just physical death, but it's spiritual death. It's being separated from God and his blessings. That's what Jesus experienced for you and me. He took our sin because he didn't have any sin. He did that so that you don't have to experience that. So all of this to say that we may not realize We've never thought about it before, that in reality, the wrath of God is all around us. It's being, being revealed everywhere we look. I mean, that, that's why Paul said this word, you know, the wrath of God is revealed. What does revealed mean? Exactly what you thought it would mean. It means that, that something is being uncovered, that something's being taken out of hiding, that it's being disclosed or that it's being made fully known. We may not view the things around us that are happening as evidence of the wrath of God only because we've never thought that way. But it's revealed to us that that's what it is. And when we focus on it, when we get to look at the scriptures and what they teach us, wow, we walk away quite surprised. (laughs) We're more familiar with the wrath of God than we ever knew. Now we know what to name it. We're eyewitnesses of the wrath of God. Now I should probably point out then, to answer our when question, when is God's wrath revealed? We could make this case biblically. Here's two obvious answers. One is that God's wrath may be revealed immediately upon a person's sin. That... that, That does happen. Or God may 
store up that wrath for a later time. And if you looked at scriptures, you would see the time frame just all over the map. I mean, think of Ananias and Sapphira. What happened to them? The moment they lied to the spirit, to the church, instantaneously dead. That was the wrath of God poured out just in an immediate sort of fashion. How about King David and Bathsheba? They had to wait nine months for the wrath of God to be revealed in their lives. When that baby born out of their adultery was born and then died, that, that was the wrath of God. I mean, it, it took centuries sometimes, though, like for the people of God. They, they began inhabiting the promised land in 1405 B.C., it wasn't until 722 B.C., you know, 700 years later, that the Assyrians came in and literally wiped them out. God used another nation as his tool to express his wrath to these people. And then it was, you know, another couple hundred years, 587 B.C., that the Babylonians came in and did the same thing. God can, take, can reveal his wrath instantaneously upon a sin. He can, he can wait any amount of time that he wants. He can wait centuries if he wants. There is one truth, though, that is always, always there. It doesn't matter whether it's immediate or whether it's sometime in the future. The guarantee is this, that the righteous, holy God will reveal his wrath against sin. He wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be just. The mind bender is that he wouldn't be loving if he didn't reveal his wrath. Because if anyone's ever sinned against you and you've wished you could take revenge for them, they've sinned against you. And you've wanted God to come in and do something about it. Well, in his way and in his time, he will pour out his wrath upon sin. You want him to do that. That's loving, in this case, the victims of sin, right? And so we see the psalmist. Haven't you read the psalms? And you, you resonate with the psalms because sometimes the psalmist says something like this, you know, man, it seems like the evil people, they're always prospering. They never get theirs. They just mistreat everybody. They walk all over everybody. It doesn't seem like there's any justice in the universe. Oh, there's justice. God may pour out his wrath in a moment. It may be at the great white throne judgment. It'll, it'll come. It's not a matter of whether a sinner will come to judgment. It's really a matter of when, and what we don't understand is it could be any time, but it will come. All of that's in the hands of, of God. So we've tried to answer the question of when, when will God's wrath be revealed. The other one, we won't take nearly as long. Over what is God's wrath revealed? Paul says it this way. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Watch what it says. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Let me make one opening statement about this and then we can tear into some of the details. But, but if you notice carefully, notice, notice very carefully what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Remember what wrath is. Wrath is God's hatred of sin. God hates sin. Does God hate the sinner? No. Look what it says. His wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and righteousness. It does say of men because unfortunately there's this collaboration that happens. Sin comes about as a result of people. But God doesn't hate people. What does God want for people? He wants salvation for every person. What he hates, though, is the sin. And he wants to eliminate that sin. So if you look carefully, you begin to see 
that working out. Keep that as kind of an anchor point in all of this. But there are two categories that Paul listed there. Let me go back and show you. Oops. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against two things, all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Okay, so take those, those two things. It's important to notice those two things. You need to know what those two things are, and we should know the order of those things. And we probably never thought about this before. We think of sin as some kind of generic sort of thing, but actually it falls into one of these two categories, ungodliness or unrighteousness. Here, here's the definitions. Ungodliness refers to sins against God. Ungodliness are sins against God. Unrighteousness are sins against other people. Got it? That should be incredibly familiar to us. You walk in on Saturday night, we have the slide up there that says Rise Church. It's got our mission statement on the bottom. What does the mission statement say? Love God, love others. Same two categories. When we fail at either of those, if we fail at loving God, that's a sin of ungodliness. If we fail at loving others, that's a sin of unrighteousness. And so it falls into one or the other of, of those two. If you're familiar at all with the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, you understand that this is really how it all works. How many tablets in the, old, in the, in the Ten Commandments? Two. The first tablet, all about how we should live in our relationship with God. The second tablet, how we should live in relationship with one another. Huh, you see the pattern? It's all about loving God and loving others. And if we sin against God by having another idol than, than him or we use his name in vain or all the things that are listed, you know, then, then we've committed a sin of ungodliness. You know, if we murder our neighbor, if we if we hate, if we steal, we rob from somebody, that's, that's a sin of unrighteousness, but it's all capsulated in this. It, it's no big surprise then when, you remember when the, the lawyer came to Jesus and said, well, Jesus, you know, what's the most important commandment of all of them? Thinking that he was going to trip him up. And you remember what Jesus said, right? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And then he says, and the second is like it, meaning the second is equal to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. That's, that's the whole game, folks. And so what we see here is if we violate laws about our relationship with God, that's ungodliness. If it's about other people, it's unrighteousness. And what does it say? God's going to reveal his wrath against sins of ungodliness and unrighteousness. He hates those sins. Unfortunately, they're tied to people. <laughs> they're tied to us. Here's what Paul says you know, a couple chapters later in Romans. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no one who's not been stained by sin. No one. We've committed sins of ungodliness. We've committed sins of unrighteousness. Let me give you just one closing kind of insight uh, as we relate this stuff together. It's something that I'd never seen before. It really was one of those things where God said, oh, you need to spend some time with this. But scholars will tell you that those two sins, the sins of, of ungodliness and the sins of unrighteousness, they, they are inextricably linked together. In other words, those two things always go together. If you find somebody who's sinning against God, you can guarantee that they're also sinning against somebody else. And if vice versa, if they're sinning against somebody else, you can be quite sure that they really don't understand and they're not living in, right, in, a, in a right relationship with God. Those two things just always go together. And, and really, that, that makes sense. Uh, one, one author said this, the history of the church bears eloquent testimony to the disaster that follows whenever these two things are separated. When people forget the importance of their relationship with God or when they forget the importance of their conduct and behavior with others. 
Failing in either one is fatal to the Christian life. Those same scholars will go on and they'll tell you this, that the order of those two things is also important. There's a reason that the first tablet of the, command, of the Ten Commandments is about how to have a relationship with God, and the second one is how to have a relationship with others. One precedes the other. It has to precede the other. You probably understand that unless you're saved, unless you have a, a growing, vibrant relationship with God, there's no way that you'll ever act in a saved way towards others. You can't give away what you don't have. You have to understand you're, you're, you're a loved person by God so that you can love. When you begin to understand how generous he is to you, that's when you become generous. When you realize that he's done everything to meet your needs, that's when you say, oh, I get it, and you begin meeting the needs of other people. It's just how it all works. The, the two go together, and one precedes the other. I mean, I mean, take, for instance, the interaction that took place in the Garden of Eden. We look at the Garden of Eden, the first thing that comes to our mind is that, that you know, Eve took the apple and bit the apple and then gave it to Adam, and then he bit the apple. Is that the first sin that was there? No. The first sin was that they listened to the serpent and they denied the goodness of God. The first sin was a, a sin of ungodliness, you know, followed quickly by a sin of unrighteousness. It's how it's always been from the very beginning. Ungodliness results in unrighteousness. So here's a point of application. If that's true, if the, the, the status, the closeness, the intimacy of our relationship with God determines our ability to love others, and it always flows in that direction, if you turn it to the positive, you understand that the closer you are to God, then the more loving you'll be to others. And so how is it that we walk this Christian life? What's of primary importance? Abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Cementing your relationship with God. Spending time with God. Being reminded of how much God loves you. Because when that relationship is strong and intact, the fruit of that relationship will be born. When Jesus is running through our veins, then fruit results like the vine and the branches. So that's, that's where this all goes. So really what we did tonight was we tried to answer a couple of questions. One was, was when is it that the wrath of God will be revealed? And we saw, well, it's being revealed all the time. It's always been revealed, it is being revealed, and it will be revealed. The second thing was, you know, well, for what was, you know, what is, for what is God's wrath revealed? It's for sin, ungodliness, and unrighteousness. Now, you know we have barely begun to get to the end of this chapter. That's all we're going to do tonight. Next week, Lord willing, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into a, a fact that's really very important and that's the idea that, you know what, there is nobody in the world, there is no excuse that can ever get you out from underneath the wrath of God. No excuses. There's only one way that that happens. Jesus. And so that's why we're going to move to the table. And I, I can't tell you enough, this table is a reminder to us that the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. Right? It's, it's the, the bread and it's the, the cup. The bread reminds us of his body that was broken. Why was it broken? The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. The, the cup represents the blood. Why did the blood have to be spilled? There's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. The, the reason the blood is so important is, is that the blood of Jesus is what it was that cleansed us. Why? Because he was taking upon himself the wrath of God in our place. That's the good news. Jesus came to save us from the wrath of God. How wonderful. 
And so every time he says, come to this table, remember me. Remember what about him? Remember that he took the wrath of God for you. That he, he came and died to save you so that you don't ever have to experience the wrath of God. That's amazing. It should lead us to worship. So you know the drill. Go to the table, grab the elements, go back to your seat. You can partake of them on your own. And the worship team tonight is going to lead us in a song. And at the end, Gabe will close us in prayer. the moments where I'm still in your presence where all noise dies down Lord speak to me now you have all my attention I will linger and listen I can't miss a thing cause Lord I know my heart wants more of you my heart wants something new so i surrender all cause all i want is to live within your love be undone by who you are my desire is to know I am desperate for a touch of heaven to go and oh and oh oh cause you're the fire in the morning you're the cool in the evening breath in my soul oh the life in my bones there is no hesitation in your love and affection it's the sweetest of all cause lord i know my heart wants more of you my heart wants something new so i surrender and all I want is to live within your love be undone by who you are my desire is to know you deeper and Lord I will open up again throw my fears into the wind Lord I am desperate for Jesus, have your way in me 
out one more time. I open up my heart to just for this Saturday night worship, God. Lord, just for this service. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that as we continue out through the rest of our night, Lord, that you just keep us safe. And Lord, that we just remain, Lord, in this heart of worship all the days of our lives. We thank you, Lord, once again for this evening. And we love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.